see the people on on uh, the waiting list? No, right? I see at the top 21 people entered the waiting room. And if okay, I hit good. view, it opens on yeah. the right hand side and I can see the names. Right, because you're co-hosts. Okay. But we're not going to admit it. That's you you do that, correct? Yeah, you all just don't worry about it, just focus on your own presentation. So we're now live on YouTube and I'll go ahead and admit all. And then as they keep coming, I'll, I'll keep admitting them. Ready? Here we go. Okay, everyone, my name is Duarte Moraes. I'm coming to you from NC State University in North Carolina, United States. We're gonna give uh, late arrivals another minute or so, and then we will uh, get started with this webinar. All right, um, I uh, will still have uh, people dropping in in these first few minutes, but um, I will just take these couple of minutes to welcome everyone here. We have an incredible group of people uh, that are gonna share their thoughts and their insights into the tourism gig economy with us today. And um, I want to emphasize that these uh, tourism webinar series was created uh, started uh, two years ago at the beginning of the pandemic because my colleague Kazem Bafadari from Japan, he's here with us today, and Dr. Um, Jafar Jafari. Um, we observed that there was a lot of work done uh, looking at how the formal tourism um, industry and big destinations, how they were reacting to the pandemic, but there was very little attention to smaller communities and to the, the base of the tourism pyramid system the real people and uh, micro entrepreneurs. And so what we felt that was needed was what you see over in that vision statement for this initiative. A group of uh, professors and students uh, interested in this topic, but engaged with communities. And today we have just that. We have a few professors um, in this uh, panel that are doing engaged research with communities trying to find ways to leverage the economic force of tourism for a more just and fair and verdant world. And then we have the privilege of having real uh, tourism micro entrepreneurs, gig workers, people that are trying to carve a little bit of their livelihoods from tourism. We have a destination manager that is trying to find ways to make his destination, our destination equitable and competitive. And then we have three members from tourism platforms, multinational companies that are shaping the new version of tourism to also try to make tourism more equitable but competitive, harnessing capitalism for social good. So what a, what a wonderful group of people to dabble around this complex issue and try to direct us to um, a better, build back better form of tourism. So uh, quickly, I wanted to point out a few uh, kind of rules of engagement would like you to have as the panelists will keep their cam cameras on, but participants, please switch off the camera to save bandwidth. Please ask questions and make comments on the chat. We have several of us looking at the chat. This is your way to shape this webinar. You're coming from all over the world and we want your perspective so that in the second part of the webinar, we can discuss your the issues that you are most concerned with. Know that we're being recorded. This is going to be available on YouTube for you to watch many times after this. And if you go to scottwebinars.org, our website, you will.
Duarte? I think we lost Dwart. He's there, he's muted. Duarte, we lost your voice. Can you check your mic? Yes. Dwart is okay. muted. There you yeah. are. So just in time to pass on to Bruno Ferreira, uh, who is the moderator for today's webinar. And um, Bruno, please take it away. Thanks, Duarte. Uh, it's really great to be here today. My name is Bruno Ferreira. I'm a professor of tourism development and management at High Tech, Haiko, uh, Hainan, China. Uh, this is a joint venture uh, by Arizona State University and Hainan University. And uh, can you please uh, give me the next slide, Gordon? Do you see it, Bruno? Uh, not yet. <laughs> okay, there it is. Thank you. Okay, so one of the global trends that we've witnessed for the past 10 to 15 years has been the rise of the gig economy. It refers to new forms of temporary, hyper-flexible employment arrangements for gigs, uh, which have become prevalent in many sectors of the economy where well-paid, secure jobs with benefits were lost. Tourism is at the forefront of the gig economy with prominent web platforms such as Uber, Airbnb, Grubhub, and here in China, Didi, which have leveraged the power of the internet to supplant established formal brick and mortar companies. So when faced with the ubiquity and the pervasiveness of the tourism gig economy, what should be the appropriate response from the sector? In this presentation, we're going to try to provide some answers to these very challenging questions. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to acknowledge some of the pros and cons. Um, next slide, please. Jamie Wong, a former CEO of the peer-to-peer -peer experience finding platform Viable, said in an interview that, open quotes, in the past, there was this huge divide between people's personal expression really being counter to economic growth and what was institutionalized. Now, what we're seeing powered by technology is the opportunity for people to live their authentic lives, follow their passion, go by their own schedules with the flexibility that they want and also continue to fuel the economy and grow industry. So I really see that as the future, which is this form of micro entrepreneurship where everyone in their own way as their own boss is building their own small enterprise that's actually fueling larger markets in the economy. Brilliantly said, I think. In my view, uh, tourist micro entrepreneurship contributes to the competitiveness of destinations in several different ways. For example, visitors increasingly seek immersive experiences with host communities where they do what locals do, eat what locals eat, and hang out with locals to learn their stories. The vernacular local culture can be as important to the destination brand as the high culture or the noble arts. However, these unique, authentic, and unscripted experiences largely fall beyond the core competencies of the formal sector. And I strongly believe that this can be efficiently outsourced to tourism micro-entrepreneurs. In this process, locals gain agency, self-determination and entrepreneurial self-efficacy, which might empower them to pursue other outstanding entrepreneurial opportunities in the destination system. To bring it home, communities that have tangible benefits from tourism are more likely to be supportive of the tourism industry. On a sobering note, however, Viable, the peer-to-peer the -peer experience finding uh, platform that I mentioned before, is now defunct, which raises questions both in terms of the scalability of the business model and also in terms of the real size of the authentic experience market. Maybe we can get to some of these questions later on in the second half of this webinar. Slide, please. Yeah, that is it. Uh, destination managers also face several challenges, 
supply can be disorganized and, and regulated, which can harm the destination's image, informal and inconsistent, and often non-responsive, not aligned with the destination's brand, or even competing with, the formal, with formal businesses. And so, in my opinion, more important than a sterile discussion of the pros and cons of the tourism gig economy, academics and destination uh, managers alike should be looking for processes and mechanisms that facilitate the creation and optimal integration of the tourism micro-entrepreneurship supply into the destination's conventional tourism product. My own research on permatourism suggests that a bottom-up driven, diverse stakeholder fabric is desirable in destination systems for as long as we have the top-down mechanisms in place to harness that potential for the greater good. This webinar's outstanding panel of speakers includes perspectives from destination management, peer-to-peer -peer web platforms, academia, as well as from the micro-entrepreneurs themselves. We actually went to great lengths, Duarte and I, uh, to make sure that our panel could speak to the diversity and complexity of the peer-to-peer -to -peer tourism business ecosystem. In the next hour and a half, our panelists will share how, under the right conditions, this cannot be stressed enough, dignified livelihoods can be carved out through tourism entrepreneurship, as well as shed light on the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead in our quest for sustainable communities meaningfully involved in tourism. Okay, so um, I will give you now our first panelist, uh, Jonathan Fries, he's the marketing director of Raleigh CVB. Uh, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bruno. Greetings from Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, I'll tell a bit about myself to begin with. Uh, I've spent now just over 20 years in the destination management or CVB industry and all of those years in North Carolina, uh, in Raleigh, uh, now our, uh, I'm now in Raleigh, and our destination has uh, welcomed, even during the pandemic, about 13 million uh, visitors last year. And across the destination, we uh, employ directly uh, in service to visitors, uh, 17,000 or so locals. Um, our destination here is an urban core and it's uh, surrounded by many smaller rural communities. So we have the chance to promote both uh, a medium sized city in, in the United States and uh, some of our locals, uh, local towns as well. Uh, we do partner with People First Tourism Inc or P1T, uh, which is a gig marketplace based in Raleigh on curating and optimizing the uh, integration of experienced micro entrepreneurs in particular, uh, like Bruno just mentioned. Also, uh, post COVID, uh, we've had the opportunity to work uh, with Airbnb in their tourism marketing program, uh, which in particular uh, has helped with destination recovery uh, in, in certain cities in the United States and, and I think around the world as well. Um, and there's three, three main ways that we have participated in that program. We've done some cross promotions with our brand websites, the Airbnb website and visitraleigh.com. We've also worked on some cooperative uh, advertising between our brands uh, and also shared analytics of the visitors that are being hosted within our destination on Airbnb. Next slide, please. Uh, there are three ways really that we uh, in, in Raleigh uh, have been able to um, begin to integrate the tourism gig economy locally into our destination marketing and promotional work. Uh, and they're all interrelated. The first is our destination brand strategy, which we started out on in 2014 uh, with some research uh, into, oops, we lost to RT, I believe. Uh, in 2014, we, we researched our brand strategy uh, with both customers of the destination as well as locals. And we determined that really uh, the Raleigh NC destination brand was about the people uh, in our area and uh, whether those people are uh, starting um, new businesses on a micro entrepreneurship level or whether they're working for our major attractions or breweries or restaurants uh, and other, um, other tourism businesses in the area. So we really have spent uh, the past uh, six years or so uh, telling their stories uh, through all of our destination marketing work. 
Um, then um, a couple years ago, we also started into tourism master planning for the destination, really for the first time on a long, uh, long range uh, sort of basis. So uh, we now have a 10 year destination strategic plan for our destination. And that also uh, uh, has allowed us to emphasize entrepreneurship and micro entrepreneurship in, in the um, destination development that we're doing here through the year 2028. Um, also, I, I have noticed just even in the past couple of years that the destination marketing industry on the whole in the United States has begun to uh, really put value on doing things that are right for the community, whereas maybe for many decades before we had focused only on maximizing profits for our area. Uh, so putting human value, putting people before profits is, it seems to be a zeitgeist in our business, but it's something that we've also embraced locally through our master planning. And then uh, lastly, the third area is um, the participatory action research that the P1T lab does here at NC State University. That was very important to us in embracing tourism micro entrepreneurship and working with the P1T company as well as working with um, university researchers, because I think it's important to always base what you're doing uh, on the research that you can then put into action as a marketer or as a destination manager. And that also sort of feeds back into uh, probably what will be our next destination brand uh, tune-up, as I call it, um, and, and, and sort of set us up with, an, with a fresh and brand strategy for the next five to 10 years, which we'll be working on probably starting next year. Next slide, please. And then there are just a few other points that I wanted to touch on in uh, talking about how destination managers, I think even outside, uh, even beyond myself and, and into other parts of the country and parts of the world, uh, can set themselves up to also embrace their local tourism uh, gig economy. And um, first of all, I would say it's it's to not be a membership CBB. That's one important thing. Uh, CBBs often um, are set up either as membership-based or partner partnership-based. Um, if they're membership-based, they can only promote those who pay them uh, to be promoted. And that makes it very difficult then, obviously, to promote individuals that are just in the informal sector of the economy and may not have the resources to pay for a CBB membership. The other thing is um, just the mindset of destination development that the CBB has, uh, whether it's uh, pursuing sort of small and network, uh, network um, of people in the area and promoting them, or really chasing, as I've seen happen, uh, large attractions such as water parks and amusement parks and such. That's not the type of destination development that we do here, um, but you kind of have to have a thinking smaller than that mindset in order for this to work very well. Um, we really do appreciate the fact that uh, People First Tourism and the gig workers um, is, an, is an equitable and sustainable program. And so that's important to us as well. And then I think the bureau and the destination manager has to have the ability to get out into the field. They have to get out into the neighborhoods uh, of the destination. And in some cases, even the pastures uh, and the farms uh, in order to meet the entrepreneurs that they can therefore build those relationships and help promote. Um, it's also been a mind shift for us um, at the Greater Raleigh CBB uh, to think in networks instead of thinking in just one-on-one -on -one partner relationships. With the formal sector, you often uh, are working with a single hotelier and building a relationship or you're working with um, someone at a museum attraction, let's say, and you're building a relationship and then that kind of builds up into a bigger story. In this case, the entrepreneurs are often found in networks. And so that's a different sort of way that you, we have to reach out into the community and sort of like uh, multiple uh, degrees of separation because entrepreneurs can often know each other and they can refer others into the program. And that's been a different type of partnership outreach for us. And then lastly, I won't elaborate on it today, uh, right now anyway, uh, but uh, you have to make as a destination manager a commitment to kind of rebuilding your IT uh, systems uh, in order to better promote this and kind of help uh, tell the story of micro entrepreneurship in your area, but also drive it toward a, a linear path to purchase. And so we can elaborate more on that later, if you like. I will close there. Thank you, Jonathan. Wonderful. It was great uh, that you were able to crystallize some of my more or less abstract and vague uh, points in, in, my, in my introduction. And so now we have our first micro entrepreneur of the evening in China or morning in the United States. I'll give you Annelise Gentile. Annelise, take it away. Thank you so much, Bruno. Hi. Thank you for having me. In an uncertain world, we all yearn to connect to what matters. What that is, how that shows up is different for each of us. But across the globe, 
it's some variation of the same, to feel safe, to be heard, and hold a sense of belonging. We all want to be validated, that we matter, and that people care. Traveling and tourism as we know it has been forever altered. And for me, so has networking. Now there's an opportunity here, and I say that creativity resides at the edge of chaos. Connecting to what matters, matters more than ever before. People have always spent money to improve their sense of safety, to deepen their sense of belonging, and to honor where they feel heard most. The why hasn't changed. What's changed is how. Hello, I'm Annalise, your conduit for change. I'm a coach, speaker, author, and artist. And I help people connect to what matters. I help leaders lean into change through coaching. And I inspire groups to connect to one another through creativity, nature, and mindfulness. It's what I call the three pillars of resilience. And these are certainly tools that we all need to manage stress in an ever-changing world. Next slide. True story. Diane, 51, a medical researcher, emailed me to schedule her first coaching session. And she wrote, quote, P.S. My stepsister lives in Massachusetts, and I keep telling her that she's welcome to visit me here in Raleigh anytime. And her response was, yes, I would love to. Can we do one of those art in the gardens together? They always look like so much fun, end quote. Now, Diane found me through attending not just one art in the garden, but seven. She's become what I call a super fan. And yes, art in the garden is so much fun, but it's also useful for well-being and community. Diane has attended multiple events, enrolling countless followers across state lines, branching into my other services like coaching, and subsequently advertising for the garden and the farm CSA. And Diane's not the only one. John saw Art in the Garden on Eventbrite while driving on I-95 from New York down to Florida. And he and his wife stopped in Raleigh because of my event. They then chose to stay overnight in an Airbnb and then began to look for houses. Again, they're not the only ones. For me, this is what the gig economy looks like and it's how it works a continuous ripple of appreciation where people lead with yes in my business i wear multiple hats and my role with people first tourism is just one small thread within a much wider web of streams of income some streams are consistent and reliable others are seasonal or simply one time occasions as a solopreneur or a micropreneur. I use gig work to discover my tribe, to expand my network and to let them know who I am and to also interact with them in a way that serves them well, pays me and potentially others and builds our web of community. It's good business and it's great for a good life. It's the ultimate well-being. Next slide. My final slide shows a little behind the scenes sneak peek of my business through highlighting five streams of income and how a tourism gig economy edge serves me and others. Coaching is my golden thread of income with regular clients that also occasionally feeds group programs like classes and destination retreats and working with leaders I inspire self-awareness, which then positively ripples back to impact the community in a positive way. Speaking comes in waves and it is fed by referrals and opportunities to present where people meet me. This is why I like working with P1T. I can shine and share what I know, but I can also serve a few basic human needs to feel safe, to be heard and have a sense of belonging. For decades, I've created occasions to inspire trust, kindness, playfulness, leadership, and learning. And whether it's a house concert that attracts 130 people to our backyard, 
or an online fireside chat to help people cope during COVID. My programs, including Art in the Garden, Art Walks, and Creativity Retreats, attracts visitors from across North Carolina, over state lines, and even overseas. Or I take them to destination adventures. Creativity, nature, and mindfulness are excellent medicine for a stressed world. It's a sneaky vegetable. It's good for you, sort of like spinach and brownies. <laughs> Choosing a micro entrepreneur lifestyle isn't easy, but I manage and I couldn't imagine it any other way. It enables me to express myself fully. That also includes creating and selling art, my book, and serves a much greater role locally and globally with intent and purpose. My tribe of clients are leaders who thrive in a learning environment. They are lifelong learners and they love to travel, support the arts, local organic culture, and so do I. So it's a win-win for all. Now my greatest challenge is the same as any business, cost-effective reach. I need more people who need to know about my services, to like and to trust me so that I can take them on a journey of discovery. Having a wider web of advocates to partner with is a tremendous value. Perks like shared advertising, wider reach, video and photo documentation, shared risk, and even guaranteed pay are collaborative successes. And I believe the ripple of value added is then a given. In an uncertain world, we all yearn to connect to what matters. And sometimes we forget how to reconnect, but somewhere deep we know. Sadauda is a Portuguese term for nostalgia. It's a yearning, the kind of yearning that we all know and love. And it takes courage to be vulnerable, to lean into hope and to lean into yes, and to remember what's important in the first place. Sadauda, when everything is uncertain, everything that is truly important becomes clear. The why isn't changing. What's changing is how. I'm Annalise, your conduit for change. Connect with me online in Raleigh and in a garden near you. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, Annalise, for your inspiring and heartfelt presentation. You might be a candidate for a vacation with an artist in Raleigh. I'll put the word for you uh, with the Absolutely. <laughs> you. Um, okay, so uh, next we have Catherine Topol, uh, who is our second micro entrepreneur of this panel. Catherine, take it away. Hi, hello, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. My name is Catherine Topol and my husband and I have been farming for just over four years in Western North Carolina. We are raising the slow growing heritage Mangalitsa pig and our business was devastated in 2020 by our loss of sales to restaurants. In 2021, we diversified into the camping business as an immediate means to generate revenue as sales continued to stall. We've had great success and I encourage you to consider this option even in its simplest form. I'm going to jump right in. I'm sure many of you have heard of Airbnb, the hosting platform for travelers. Well, there are several camping hosts that are similar and are geared toward all levels of camping. There are many names in the camping game, so definitely do your research before deciding on a platform. Namely, the company may not provide services in your area or offer terms that you like. For example, we did not consider one particular platform because the camper does not actually pay to stay on your property. They're encouraged to spend at least $20, but are not required to do so. So we were not interested in these particular terms at the time. We wanted a host that was dedicated to tent camping because this is what we had to offer. The benefits, next slide, please. The benefits of opening your land to campers are many. We were at first uncomfortable with the idea of strangers on our land and deeply concerned about bad behavior and abuse of our property and animals. 
We have not experienced one inkling of anything of the sort and in fact have met only lovely families, couples and professionals. So these fears aside, the benefits are minimal startup costs. We mowed the grass and put rocks in a circle for a fire pit. Our tables were made out of pallets and plywood. The low overhead and labor, we simply greeted the campers upon arrival and escorted them to their sites. There was little to no interaction after this point other than a big friendly wave as we tender our chores. We love that we control the entire camping schedule, cancellation policies, <clears throat> excuse me, and pricing. Best of all, many of our farm expenses that were previously not tax deductible are now eligible, such as fuel for mowing, planting flowers, and even outdoor furniture. Another wonderful benefit is selling our farm raised pork to our campers. We lost all of our wholesale sales in 2020, but now we had a captive retail customer. Once they discover the novelty of our pigs, <clears throat> excuse me, their camping experience is enhanced when they cook a mangalit sacopa steak or bratwurst over their campfire. Their purchases have even influenced the way we process our pigs. We now provide unique cut cuts that are campfire friendly. Lastly, we really enjoy the social nature of hosting as we have met truly fabulous people and it's created a social avenue for us that we never experienced or expected. There are a few challenges. Camper inquiries take the majority of my time. Farm chores may have to be delayed because of check-ins and check-outs. Inclement weather can influence site accessibility and camper traffic will take a toll on your roads and your grass. Negative reviews are always unpleasant and seem unfair. We've taken the approach to turn them into an advertisement. I strongly encourage you to not be tempted to try and right the wrong, but just roll with it and say something genuinely nice. It will always work in your favor. Late arrivals are challenging for us in that we like to go to bed. So those are a few of our challenges and there are certainly a few important considerations. For instance, establish, establishing a separate legal structure, considering taking on additional insurance and managing fees and taxes, if any, with your government. Should you branch into glamping or cabin rentals, keep in mind you must adhere to fire and building codes, which may include building roads for fire trucks and installing sprinkler systems. Don't assume these are not issues, no matter how simple or small your accommodation. Next slide, please. Camping by nature is an avenue where one can express their independence and freedom. It's an opportunity to disconnect from daily life and reconnect with nature. Camping rigs are evolving to meet the needs of the experienced and novice alike. It's a great deal of fun to strike out on one's own. Glamping is the upscale version for those who enjoy their creature comforts in a unique setting, one where you provide the shelter, the bed, etc. The future of camping is unknown, but I predict it will be a blend of camping with an aspect of hospitality as well as unique experiences. So many of our campers never leave the farm during their stay. This is a ripe opportunity to educate and entertain them. We are expanding into a mix of primitive camping and glamping decks with full bathrooms. Our strategy is to appeal to a broad spectrum of tastes and income levels. My best advice is to use what you have and are willing to maintain. Our woolly pigs provided an immediate draw with our riverside setting increasing our appeal. As we develop our program further, we are focusing on what we enjoy first and foremost. My skills and experience are in landscape and interior design, hospitality and professional self chef services. So evolving into a food centered farm tour or farm stay is both an enjoyable and lucrative venture that will help us sustain our farm and ultimately our community. We wanna help our visitors make the connection between farms and food. Enjoying food in a farm setting is a highly tactile experience that influences consumers to more likely advocate for and spend more on local foods. Our goal is to showcase our pork and products from other area farms in a collaborative effort. Don't hesitate to work with your neighbors. And I'd advise you to seek organizations that may offer grants to support your efforts. I am certain that when it comes to camping, no matter the accommodation, the satisfaction of cooking dinner over a campfire or brewing 
cowboy coffee while watching the sunrise will never lose its appeal. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and want to thank you for having me. I also want to extend to you an invitation to contact me should you have any questions or thoughts on setting up your own venture. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. A uh, very insightful uh, presentation on the uh, challenges and opportunities of farm slash rural tourism. Thank you so much. And now we shift gears to perspectives from uh, platforms. And our next uh, guest speaker um, is Kitika Agarwal, and she's the founder and CEO of VAWA, Vacation with an Artist. Kitika, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bruno. Um, and it was so lovely to hear from Annalise and Catherine uh, on the, you know, who are the micro entrepreneurs providing um, services to tourists. Um, and when we look at VAWA, which is vacation with an artist, we are serving these micro entrepreneurs who are the artists. Um, so what VAWA is, is uh, a platform that enables um, any artist, any master artist to share their knowledge um, and their craft and their skills uh, with travelers from around the world. Um, I'm a designer myself, and for the past 25 years, I've been traveling around the world, learning from master artists. And one of the things um, that stuck with me is spending time with them was truly transformational. Um, I believe master artists um, are the fingerprints of humanity. Um, they are the ones who shape our culture. Um, in real time. So when you are going to a destination, you, you know, most of the times we're experiencing um, art through museums, which is usually artists who are not living anymore, or we're experiencing art through tchotchkes and souvenirs. Um, but in, in a destination, you have, you have these living artists, living master artists who are creating culture in, in real time. And to be able to connect to them, uh, to spend um, a few days with them and, um, and learn from them is truly transformational. So the way VAWA works is <clears throat> you can book a private uh, mini apprenticeship uh, with a master artist. Um, so an example, you could be spending five to six days with a master calligrapher in Japan, in Kyoto, uh, where you are learning um, hands-on skills of calligraphy, but you're also immersing yourself into the calligraphy culture um, of Kyoto. Uh, or you could be spending six days in Norway learning from a master photographer, um, going from island to island and, and learning hands-on skills to develop uh, film photography, but like plant and landscape. Um, so what you're doing is it's a combination of, as Annalise was mentioning, it's it's a combination of learning your skill, learning new creative skills, but you're also connecting to nature, but you're also connecting to yourself um, and and it's a time to really recharge rejuvenate and and come back home with a souvenir which is not a tchotchke but an experience as uh, something that stays with you so one of the things we see is a lot of people go on this because either they are burnt out you know we've been we've all been spending so much time in front of computers um so a lot of people are craving this connection to things that are hands-on they're con craving connection to the makers connection to where things are made um uh, a lot of people are, are just wanting more active uh, vacations. And so this becomes one of those. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so um, we are currently working with 110 artists in 27 different countries. Um, they range a variety. Um, they range in a variety of art forms. They provide from ceramics, sculpture, bamboo bicycle making, uh, bespoke leather shoe making, um, you know, ebru calligraphy. So it's really uh, bringing the crafts and culture of the world um, um, to the forefront in, in, in the world. So, um, so the benefits for these master artists are, are they are one getting um, a global exposure because a lot of lot of artists they're really great at 
at their craft, but they're not necessarily, you know, great at marketing. So they're not very well known around the world, although they are masters and in the local culture, they're, they're very well known. Um, we're, we're, they, we're also providing them a platform to teach and share their knowledge because right now a lot of them want to teach, but they don't have a platform um, to reach out to people, something that manages all the, um, you know, all the content, all the bookings and payments for them. So they're looking for support there. So we're providing that support to these micro entrepreneurs, to these artists um, uh, by giving, giving them a way to teach. Uh, a lot of them are not great at, you know, especially from different cultures, they are not the best at presenting themselves or telling the stories about themselves, what they do. So that's another big thing we support them with is editorial and design support so that their content looks as great as as some other artists content across the world, just because they might be better at maybe English or better at design, you know, so we don't want those things to come in the way of, of, um, of presenting how great they are at their craft, because that's what really matters. Um, uh, and of course, none of the artists want to manage uh, bookings because lot there are a few platforms out there where a lot of artists can offer services but then they end up doing a lot of the the admin work of managing bookings communicating with customers and managing refunds and cancellation and it adds a lot of work to the artists and these artists are master artists they want to focus on their craft they want to be working and producing work they don't want to be managing these things so um so that is a huge support that we provide to these artists is <clears throat> a unique service layer where they don't have to be managing that there's a dedicated person who is supporting them in managing all their bookings. Um, and of course, you know, they're earning additional income. And, and uh, for a lot of the artists, um, some of, um, you know, their crafts are dying, they're endangered. So we are, for example, working with one of the last 10 remaining um, uh, makers in Japan who makes Buddhist ring bells. Um, he's one of the last and remaining. And so he's very interested in passing this craft on to more people so that the craft evolves. So a lot of artists want their crafts to not die. And as they get older, you know, the craft dies with them. Um, so they, they also have a higher purpose in, in teaching. So, so as a, as a platform, that's what we're hoping we can support these master artists with. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, so, oh, some images are missing. I don't, oh, they're there. Uh, so, so in terms of destinations, uh, we are focusing on both rural as well as urban areas. So it's not just the big cultural cities like Barcelona, Paris, London, you know, Tokyo, but also the, the rural areas. For example, we have um, um, the G's band, famous quilters in Alabama. Um, and, you know, Alabama may not be big for, for tourism, but we are highlighting the, the cultural assets of that destination um, in a new way. You know, people might know uh, just the famous landmarks or the food of that place, but they don't know the people, the masters, the people who are the, the real assets of that place. And so, um, so through this platform, we hope we can bring um, more, um, uh, uh, awareness to these hidden assets who are the people. Uh, it's also creating a totally new economy because <clears throat> these artists are producing products. So when, when you look at the global scale, the kind of products we buy around the world, um, they come from all around the world, but we only have awareness of products that we see. But the more we engage with these master artists in different cultures, we're, we're creating more awareness of the kind of products we could have in our homes, the kind of products we could be using. So, so now we are also creating a new economy, which is not just happening in destination. So it's not just me going to, to you know, Turkey and learning a craft and paying the local entrepreneur at that time, but um, it's creating a long lasting impact because now I'm more aware of Ebru painting. So now I will 
be living in Brooklyn and looking for Ebru painting and eventually the whole world of Ebru painting, um, you know, uh, grows, you, the brushes, the paint. So it just, it takes the local economy into like, a into it scales it globally in, in many ways and in a long lasting way. And lastly, uh, as I mentioned, it just um, fosters the sustainability for local crafts, which is super important for, for us to, um, uh, sustain um, for our culture. Uh, that's what makes makes us. That's what uh, makes this world so beautiful. Um, so yeah. So we're we're hoping that uh, through through Bawa we're able to serve um, these master artists who are micro entrepreneurs, um, serve the destinations, and also serve. Um, people who are really wanting to go deeper into the communities they travel to um, be more responsible and 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 really connect with them in a way that lasts beyond their vacation um, so thank you wonderful Gitika. thank you so much for uh, introducing creative tourism to our audience which is, of course, not only a vibrant niche market, but also a burgeoning field of inquiry in academia. And so I will introduce you our second representative from the platforms. Uh, I give you Sash Hickey, uh, Partnerships and uh, PR Coordinator. Sash, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having um... I appreciate the chance to be here and having the opportunity to share more about Harvest Host. Um, Harvest Host has actually been around since 2010. It's been a pretty small platform up until the last two years. Uh, the pandemic has actually increased the amount of members and hosts that we have significantly. Um, it's been a it's been a really unique and exciting time for our company, but also a big time of growth that we did not uh, anticipate. A lot of people are still having the chance to travel by RVs and road travel, and that has been um, unexpected for us. So we've seen a lot of challenges ourselves, but enjoyed the growth and getting to bring more people to our platform. Next slide, please. So a little bit about Harvest Hosts. We are a camping membership that connects small businesses to our self-contained RVers. So our members just pay a one-time uh, annual fee of $99. And in turn, they will go and support our hosts that we have brought on board by purchasing um, goods or services. They might take a tour. Um, sometimes they'll come in and have a glass of wine or go eat at a restaurant. Um, we have anything from farms to golf courses. We've got churches on our platform, museums, wineries, orchards, breweries, distilleries, all kinds of great small businesses that really have experiences to offer that probably wouldn't be able to allow overnight stays other than um, the potential of an RV or showing up. So all of our members are self-contained. That means the host does not need to provide any services. They don't need to provide any water or electric or Wi-Fi, anything like that. It's off the grid. It's just a, a space to park and something to sell so our members can uh, patronize the business as they spend the night. Um, it's very customizable. It's supposed to fit into the business plan that's already existing. Uh, we can use your business insurance. That covers most of everything you would need, so there's no insecurity there. Um, we just ask that there's a space to park overnight. So in your host profile, um, you would be able to distinguish the nights that you'd like people to stay overnight. If maybe you have busy weekends and you only want to host people during the week, we give that total flexibility and up to the host. They get to accept or deny the stays for every member that's coming. So they can decide if they happen to not be able to take somebody that night, they can deny the stay and, and make it more you know comfortable for their business. It's just supposed to be streamlined to fit into the business model that's already existing. And we do not take any of the sales. Harvest Host uh, gives 100% of whatever the member purchases at the business that goes straight to the host. And um, our goal is really just to create unique experiences where our viewers, sometimes they're just looking for a one night overnight stay and they actually go stay in a Walmart parking lot or a Cracker Barrel parking lot. And so instead they're coming and they're staying at a, an orchard or a farm and they get to experience something that they might not have ever experienced. We actually see a lot of families traveling by road that are full-time on the road. 
they love coming to farms. They get to experience different things with their kids and maybe enjoy some activities, feed the animals or help with chores. And our members are often very willing to do this on top of um, trying to support the business by purchasing something. So we have over 200,000 members on our platform. Like I said, we've grown exponentially in the last two years. We're finding um, in a survey from 2020 that the average spend per night was $50 per night. And our, um, our hosts that we have hosts who go above and beyond. We don't expect any of this, but we have hosts who might have like a gift bag when you show up or they automatically say, we're going to take you on a tour of our farm. So it's really, it's not, there's no money that's involved, no cost um, associated with being a host, but there is some time that it takes to be a host. So the more time you're willing to put in, the greater return you'll see. Um, and we're expecting to see around $40 million spent throughout our um, three, we're at almost 3,000 host locations this year. So close to 40 million spent at, across all of our host platforms. So we're really excited about that opportunity to give back to small businesses. Next slide. And just a little bit about how a business can benefit. So what we like to say is it's a unique and free marketing opportunity. We go ahead and every time a business gets tagged by a member, we share that on social media. We have a blog that we sh um, share and highlight our hosts. It's we just all about sharing our hosts and what they do for our members. It's, of course, a member focused platform, you know, they are coming to us to find places to stay, but our hosts are what make our business what it is. And we couldn't do it without the incredible hosts that we have. So we try to give back in any way that we can, um, whether it's just featuring a host to be able to say, check this host out and head this way. If you're traveling from this place to this place, here are some great hosts to stop along the way. So we really try to highlight them as much as possible. And of course, the revenue is a great additional thing. We've got success stories from the pandemic where some small businesses said we were able to save their business. They didn't, they weren't allowed to have anybody on property or anybody come into their brewery, but they were allowed to have an RVer stay overnight in their parking lot. And they were still able to sell them, you know, a bottle of wine or something like that. And that kept the revenue flowing throughout the pandemic. So really grateful for that, to have that opportunity. And we also think that it brings some new guests to your business that might have not otherwise stopped through. So we have a lot of people who live full time on the road who are traveling full time and they're looking just to have that one night stay and they might not have stopped and the opportunity to go visit a new business. And um, it also brings more people to that small town. You might not think of it, but they would fill up on gas or maybe they need some groceries or you know they support the, the local economy and other ways besides just stopping and spending the night at that business. So it's been a, a wild two years. Like I said, we've been around since 2010, but really grateful for the, the amount of growth that we've had and being able to give back and connect with small businesses. And our, our hosts are really incredible. And we're so grateful that we've had the opportunity to meet each of them. And we do try to engage with them as often as possible and really learn their story and hear what is going good for them, what's going bad and how we can do better. So yeah, that's a little bit about Harvest Host. I appreciate the time to share and would be happy to answer any questions at the end. Maybe Bruno has fallen out of the call. So I am, uh, I'll take on the role of uh, introducing Alyssa uh, from Airbnb. Alyssa, would you take it away? Yes. Hi, everyone. It's been so great to learn from um, other panelists and happy to jump in here. My name is Alyssa Ramirez, and I am a partnerships manager and the North America lead for the Airbnb Entrepreneurship Academy. I'm focused on promoting sustainable travel, looking at areas of economic empowerment and environmental protection. Airbnb's purpose is to connect people through travel and 4 million hosts are welcoming guests in communities across the world. And Airbnb, we look to promote the kind of travel and tourism that is good for hosts, guests, and local communities. And next slide. There are opportunities for micro entrepreneurs to succeed on Airbnb through homes. So sharing a spare room or entire home listing or through experiences by sharing a skill or passion uh, with other people, either online or in person. And during the pandemic, we saw that 
Hosting on Airbnb has met people's financial needs at a really crucial moment. Hosts on Airbnb set their own price and availability, and they keep up to 97% of the price they charge. And this can make a really huge difference uh, to supporting livelihoods. The majority of hosts are women, about 55%, which is in line with traditional hospitality. And two in five women reported needing their Airbnb earnings to make ends meet in 2020. Um, and also interesting that new women hosts who have started hosting in just the last year, collectively earned more than $1 billion through Airbnb. I'll share a bit about the Airbnb Entrepreneurship Academy, which is a program focused on supporting emerging entrepreneurs in underrepresented communities. Airbnb partners with local nonprofits, government agencies, and academic institutions to tap into the tourism potential of their region. This is a partner-led model that is tailored to the needs of the community and provides um, opportunities for economic empowerment. This program initially began in South Africa and it was focused on skills development for women and youth in township and rural communities who were interested in tourism. And we recently expanded this program and offered the first academy in the US this year. We worked in partnership with the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in Western Mountain Region of North Carolina, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's a very um, scenic destination, rural with high tourism demand. And this program, we launched it in the fall with 22 participants from the Cherokee, Halawa, Saponi, and neighboring communities. Uh, through this program, we found that many participants were excited to turn their uh, existing assets, whether it was land, an inherited home, um, or a skill that they're passionate about to boost the economy in their rural area and generate additional income. Uh, people were also excited to share more about their culture and family history and the opportunity to, opportunity to provide a warm and authentic experience to travelers. But we are now working to expand the program to other cities and communities across the country. This includes a partnership with the Beaufort County Community College in the Eastern Coastal Region of North Carolina, which will be offering the Academy as a course through their small business center in the spring. And I'll take a look at um, destinations on the next slide. Communities benefit when tourism dollars stay in the community and hosts keep money they earn in the community and guest spending also stays. So this can have a really tremendous impact on places outside of traditional hotel zones and in emerging markets. Hosted travel also provides a significant boost to local employment. Uh, Oxford Economics recently did a study of Airbnb economic benefits in 30 communities where we operate. They found that in 2019, Airbnb supported over 300,000 jobs in those communities, including jobs in restaurant, retail, transportation, and entertainment. And we also look to take a proactive approach working with local governments. We have uh, worked with communities where we operate to help them collect tax revenue on Airbnb activity. And since 2014, when we first began doing this, Airbnb has delivered more than $4 billion in tourism related taxes to local governments on behalf of our global host community. And we collect and remit taxes in approximately 30,000 jurisdictions around the world, covering thousands of cities and the number continues to grow. The last area I'll talk about is tourism dispersal and responsible travel. And one thing to note that Airbnb listings are located in a wide range of neighborhoods, including places that do not typically benefit from tourism. And because hosts are utilizing their homes, this adds additional tourism infrastructure without the need to build additional infrastructure. And since the pandemic began, 6,000 cities around the world have welcomed their first Airbnb guests, joining more than 100,000 cities and towns with active listings around the world. We also work to align with key partners to understand destination needs and work together to identify sustainable solutions. This past year, I think we all saw that people were looking to get outside and get into nature and the top 
trending US destinations this summer in the US were a short driving distance from a state or national park. And visitation to national parks uh, sites across the country were at an all time high. So Airbnb partnered with the National Park Foundation on a campaign that focused on tips for responsible recreation in the outdoors. And at the same time, we worked with the Trust for Public Land to highlight off the beaten path nature destinations as a way for travelers to uh, beat the crowds and disperse tourism to places who actually wanted the additional benefits of the tourism. So these are just some ways that we work with partners to amplify their messaging and expertise in order to support and benefit the destinations. And to close, I will uh, tie this back to the Entrepreneurship Academy, where I worked alongside our partner, Sabrina Arch, with Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And she noted, this model aligns with our ecotourism strategy to preserve our natural landscapes and beautiful scenery while providing more places to stay that make visitors feel like locals in Cherokee, North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Bruno's connectivity seems to be unreliable, so uh, I appreciate this presentation and all other uh, presentations, and hopefully Bruno will be back on in, in four minutes um, to you know, lead us through the next uh, phase of the um, of the webinar. But to kind of uh, in in Scott webinars, we have this um, tradition of taking a quick break from these wonderful presentations, give us a chance to maybe even stretch a little bit. And um, this in this webinar, I would like to share with you a couple of videos. Actually, the first two minutes of of two videos about micro entrepreneurs in in the destination where I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. And um, so I'll, I'll you know, treat you to that. And then Bruno, whenever we finish the second viewing, the floor is yours again. We're not receiving the sound. You have to put on the original sound, Bruno. I mean, um, Dwart. I, I At forgot the very to... top of your Zoom, it'll say original sound. Okay, let's try that again. Now we can hear it. Now? Thank you. This place is about transformation. Change, it's about imagination, and it's about the things that come in and st stir your mind and get you to think about things differently. At the end of the day, life is a creative process, and most people are not in relationship with their own creative process, their own creativity. I help them imagine, I help them see things differently, and remember what is it about them that maybe they've forgotten along the way. My name is Annalise Gentili, and I am an integrative life and leadership coach and process artist. And just pause and know that you are here, creative, resourceful, and whole. And as a coach, I help professionals and leaders navigate change. And as a process artist, I kind of do the same thing, but I do so in a sometimes wild and woolly way where I help people find their answers using the creative process. So creativity is that backdoor approach for you to understand where are you now? I think what's different for people around the creative process is a sense of awareness. And people who consider themselves creatives own that. They have a relationship to it. They play with it on a regular basis. People who are I would call them an observer, and they would maybe call themselves a, a non-creative, just either haven't been reminded that creativity is a part of who they are, they never learned in the first place, or they have distanced so far away from it as a growing adult that they lose that connection. And so I- All right, sorry for the, the quick stop. Um, so these are videos that we make 
uh, at PUNT Lab, at People First Tourism Lab at NC State. If you search for this on online, you should be able to find them. I hope that this piques your interest and you um, try to find a lot of our videos. We made about 30, of, 30 videos about these people like Annalise and, uh, um, let's see, the next one. This is about Farmer Jen. And she's also from this destination and gives you a perspective. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a video of Catherine and her farm yet, but I hope we can make that happen soon. But this one uh, brings you into the, the life and the kind of charismatic uh, and idealistic farmers that also characterize this destination. Here we go for just the first two minutes. My days always begin walking outside and opening up the chickens. I usually gather eggs and take care of the greenhouse or the propagation house where all the seedlings are. The propagation house is one of my favorite places to be. It just has that smell of earth when you go in and growing things. You just can't describe it any other way. It just it smells like life. My day usually starts with me waking up thinking about a dream I had about food, really. <laughs> My brain is constantly thinking about different ways of making a dish more delightful, more interesting to look at with the textures, like how to get it right. Chickadee Farms is a small-scale, um, sustainably managed produce farm uh, in Clayton, North Carolina. We grow a diversity of vegetables, herbs, and this year we're starting to do cut flowers. The Fiction Kitchen is a very unique spot in downtown Raleigh. We're Raleigh's only full vegetarian vegan restaurant. Where Jen and I come together is really with the flavor of the produce. Sometimes it looks so perfect, I don't wanna do anything with it. But then what that moves to is how can I elevate this? I take a lot of pride in the quality of my food and you know that I want it to taste really delicious and amazing. And then she takes that and kind of like amplifies it by like a hundred, you know? <laughs> Okay, so this gives you just a sneak peek into the work we've been doing for about a decade, studying these charismatic local people that can make a destination so much more vibrant, but they're usually wedged out of the formal tourism sector, and they're just understudied and under understood. And, you know, just uh, from what I've been hearing today, there's just so much to unpack. So Bruno, I'm going to turn it back over to you so that you can lead us through the next 30 or 40 minutes of structured discussion. I wonder if you can hear me now? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so next, um, that's where all the fun starts. We will have uh, Dr. Tom Baum, who is a professor at uh, the University of Strathclyde. So Tom doesn't know, but he was the first scholar that I ever cited in a very humble um, fact sheet where I was discussing how web platforms sometimes they can widen um, inequalities. So uh, Tom will uh, summarize the presentations uh, of the first part and will relate them with his ongoing research on tourism, employment and the gig economy. So Tom, the floor is yours. And Tom, you're muted. That has to be the, the most commonly cited um, expression in the, in, in the current environment. So um, thank you for your introduction, uh, Bruno. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I think it's, it's a fantastic concept, your, your webinar. I think this particular theme is innovative. It's 
it's bringing the in the the gig economy into the rural economy uh, into the rural world into the peripheral world i mean i work uh, i've worked over the years extensively in what might be called um peripheral tourism marginalized areas um away from the mainstream and to see the gig economy penetrate in a very positive way these areas for me is really exciting i think the gig economy uh, for better or for worse, has got a um, a bad name, particularly in a urban um, city context, and sort of debates over its impact on urban change, on gentrification, on social exclusion, and in in my terms, the the quality of employment that is that has been created um, has sort of as 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 I say hits the the media in a very negative way. And it's great, uh, great to hear alternative stories that we did, and particularly from some of the bigger providers. I mean, I think um, I really enjoyed Elisa's message about what Airbnb is doing on a much more positive side uh, compared to the sort of, um, if you like, the commodification, the, the investment approach to hosting, which um, which gets the headlines, um, certainly in Europe at the moment. I'm involved with a, a project which is urban based at the moment in Europe, and we're working with um, with uh, nine other uh, cities across Europe. Ours is based in Edinburgh, looking at the relationship between the gig economy and um, and and, and social, social exclusion in its broadest sense. And what I heard today is actually, uh, it, 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 if you like, redresses the balance, because what we're talking about is, if anything, social inclusion, whether it's an agriculture, whether it's supplementing agricultural um, incomes, whether it's facilitating talent, artists globally um, through, uh, through the connectivity that the, 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 um, that the platform provides with potential customers. Mm -hmm. I think if there is a word that I, I take out of this whole um, uh, discussion today, it is connectivity and it's connectivity at a, at, um, at a, a, a level that is, that, that is complementary to people's everyday activities, whether it's in farming, whether it's um, in, 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 in other areas. I was also particularly interested to hear um, if you like, the, um, the, the, the local government, the city government view from a tourism perspective of how the gig economy is incorporated into the mainstream, again, in what sounds like a very sympathetic and positive way. Could I um, have the slides moved on, please? Um, I can't see the slides. Are oh, they coming back? Okay, we lost them. Can you move the, move them on? Yeah, and I just wanted to sort of pick up on um, from a sort of an academic point of view on a couple of other things here. Um, it's worth remembering, and it was good to hear from the Airbnb the the um, perspective, the the global reach of the uh, the informal co um, economy, and the lessons that uh, that that can be learned both from the experience, particularly in North Carolina, but also in, in, in the reverse direction. And um, we, we've done quite a lot of work in Southern Africa recently and looking at the relationship, particularly of the, the globe, uh, of the gig economy, the emerging gig economy um, to the established informal economy. And um, I think we may see the gig economy as a way of of regularizing some of the more precarious elements, the more vulnerable elements of, um, um, of the informal economy in countries like uh, South Africa, which I think would be very positive. And I think some of the lessons, again, that we've learned about today um, will travel, have the opportunity to travel. Um, I was also very interested um, in, um, in, in the the narrative around harvest hosts. And if you could move on um, a slide for me, please. Um, I picked up something in the in our in our media here, in our, 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 
um, newspaper and the newspapers here, looking at, uh, looking at ways in which um, communities uh, can take, if you like, control over their own lives. And I'm, I'm apologies to Elisa here, but um, this is a, the Scottish a, a group of Scottish islands which have been fighting, who have been who've launched their own platform at a, 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 as a community enterprise, as a community activity with the objective of, of feeding any profits into community initiatives, um, but also with the specific objective of, of challenging um, what, we, what is substantially a, a problem in rural Scotland and elsewhere in Europe of second homes, of holiday homes, um, if you like, taking over communities and um, creating an unaffordable um, environment for young people from those communities, forcing young people to migrate out of their, their home communities because they basically can't afford to live there. So this sort of initiative, I think, is, is, um, uh, is, is, is very positive. So I think there is so much more that one can say about our presentations. I think connectivity, innovation, integrating with the existing um, um, economy and, 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 and culture of communities. I think that's all incredibly, those are incredibly positive messages. And I've said enough, I'm, I'm much more interested in hearing what our participants, our audience have to say, and listening to some of the questions that hopefully will come from the audience at this point. But I just want to thank um, all the all the presenters this afternoon because I've learned a huge amount. That probably wasn't the intention of the exercise, but I really feel that I have. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Back to you, Bruno. Um, I, I suggest that Annalise and Catherine, if you're able to kind of get ready to share with us kind of a, a, a takeaway from you or a thought or a reflection or a question, uh, as we give Bruno time to situate his connectivity, would one of you like to go? Sure, I'd like to. Thank you, Duarte, for your introduction. And um, I'll say this. This, the patterns are self-similar at every scale, and there's a little bit in everybody's presentation that just sounds familiar. We're, we're all trying to create a, a better world. We're trying to support the human side of business, which is really important. Um, I love the quote that artists are the thumbprint of humanity. I so believe that as an artist myself. And we need one another to f solve some problems. I think my, my big aha was in um, learning from Sash about Harvest Host and 40 million, <laughs> just blown away by mm -hmm. making money by going out into the woods. <laughs> I mean, I'm an avid camper myself, but the, the hugeness of that, that really speaks to where people are right now, that we want in some ways, that Sauda word, we want to get back to the basics. And the basics is about connecting to the things that really, really matter. The ones we love, the spaces we want to support, and we want a takeaway. We want to learn something, but not in a way that um, adds more stress to our life, we want to learn in a way that allows us to release stress. And it's for me, it's just an aha, yes, yes, and. We are all saying the same thing, but in a slightly different way. So it's wonderful to be able to support one another here. So that's my two cents. Thank you, Duarte. Thanks, Annalise. Catherine, are you interested in? I, I, I'm here, yes, I thoroughly enjoyed um everything. It was really interesting. I've never participated in this type of platform internationally. I'm, I'm honored to be here. I, you know, as, as a micropreneur, um, and I have had several careers as a yacht captain, as a golf professional, 
um, um, as a professional chef, a landscape architect, and now I'm pig farmer. So I don't get invited to a lot of parties. This is kind of like a party <laughs> for me. I, I'm totally teasing. But I think what my um, what I would like to just really emphasize as far as my participation here is that you're only limited by what you think you're limited by. Um, I had people tell me I couldn't be a golf professional. I took up golf at 26. I was a golf pro. I did very well. And then I always say I get a little bored at every six years and reinvent myself in a new way. And then I became a 1600 ton yacht captain. I mean, really at 34, you can go be a, become a yacht captain. Yes, you can. So, you know, the pig farming um, it has been interesting. It's connected me to the land. I was always had horses or wanted to have horses. So I guess my whole point is to kind of wrap it up in that whatever your interests are that make you excited to get out of bed every day, they may seem disconnected. I assure you they are not. Um, people, I joke that we traded the salt for the mud and um, that's going to happen this winter, I'm sure. But whatever you love, you know, and if you don't know what you love, think back maybe to what you enjoy between the age of seven and 14 or 15. And those things, you can absolutely create your own lifestyle that's going to generate income for you and your family. Um, like I said, they may seem disconnected. I assure you they are not. We're having so much fun. We consider our farm, our canvas, whether it's for social or planting or architecture, um, bringing people in, sharing, education. It's really been just an unfolding that we could never have expected. We are lucky in Western North Carolina, and I'm sure there are many around the world have the organizations that support your efforts. Don't think there's not help out there. Don't think you're not important, no, no matter how simple or small your venture might be. And then don't be closed-minded. Don't have an agenda for your success. I assure you that you will, um, will, everything will unfold in a way that's bigger and better than you may have imagined or planned. So don't hold too tightly to that plan. Thank you, Catherine. Jonathan, I, if I could, I'd like to put you on the spot and then hope maybe Bruno uh, and Tom, maybe you can have some questions for our tourism gig economy platform guests. Uh, but if I could, you know, I, I see you kind of in this crucial bridge space between these new internet platform information system solutions that have the potential and as we heard today, the goal of bringing people like these amazing young women, old souls like Annalise and Catherine uh, to the forefront of the new tourism experience, right? But, you know, how do you feel in that role? Are you, do you feel like excited about it? Do you feel handcuffed to old ways and old policies? Or, you know, do you feel emboldened and that you're leading the way and in, in building tourism back better and you're, you're hopeful or you're, Frustrated, or where are you in that? I'm not. I'm not frustrated, and um, and I would say I, I couldn't ask for a better uh, commercial for the Raleigh area than what you provided there in the cultural break. I would. I would much rather uh, that people think of the Raleigh area as a place to meet these passionate people and artists and makers than you know we certainly have formal sector attractions and such that that have attracted visitors to our area for years. But I'd much rather they think about the people uh, first uh, now. Uh, than those things. I will admit, you know, 20 years ago when I entered the industry, I, I really was focused only on the economic impact of visitation. I, I admit it. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, particularly in the past uh, five or so years, um, I, be, I have begun to recognize and see, see tourism through a more, more of a critical prism uh, to, uh, to see that, that there are ways that we can uh, make people's lives better beyond the, beyond the visitors' lives. You know, we really need to put the locals first and put the community first um, as well. And I appreciated Tom's comment about um, inclusivity as well, because that's the way that I think I now look, look at all of this also as, as being more inclusive to all the, um, the informal aspects of our local economy uh, as well. There was an illustration there on my last slide too of, of, a, of a boardroom table. I didn't have a chance to say earlier of a boardroom table where uh, all the hoteliers who are the traditional stakeholders of visitors bureaus were sitting at one end of the table. And in that illustration, we added a leaf to the table and we made the table bigger uh, to be more inclusive of micro entrepreneurs who were all sitting on the right side uh, of the screen. So um, I think that that's very important now for, for all destination uh, marketers and managers to consider. Great, thank you. Bruno, 
Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yeah, I'm in and out. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would like to ask a question to Alisa um, because building on the words of, uh, of Tom, um, short term rental accommodation platforms, um, namely Airbnb, they sometimes get a, a bad rap. So, I'm really curious to see how do you guys at Airbnb take this criticism? What, what kind of internal discussions do you have about this? So maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this. Hey, thanks for the question. Um, I think these are really great and important questions to be asking. Um, from our perspective, we do like to take a proactive approach in working with, with cities, with tourism organizations, um, such as Visit Rally to align with, with their goals and um, it is a complicated issue and I don't think I can really sum it up in a concise way, but um, just looking at kind of the, the balance between um, advocating for our hosts, advocating for neighborhoods. Um, there's a lot of stakeholders as part of the tourism ecosystem. And it's really about finding that kind of community empowerment and striking the right balance. Alyssa, did your program the academy, is that part of the company's reaction to these things that are unearthed, the less rosy things? Um, I wouldn't say di directly. It was really stemmed out of um, looking at the platform, and this was specifically in Cape Town, South Africa at the time, and seeing the opportunity where in rural communities and townships outside of Cape Town, that uh, there were opportunities for individuals in, the, in those areas who were interested in tourism but didn't really know how to tap into it and to bring travelers um, where, who, who could only find listings kind of in the, the Cape Town area. I'm not as familiar with, with the community, so I hope I don't misrepresent anything, um, but to really to bring tourism to places who really wanted to make that part of their ecosystem to help benefit the residents in those areas. Thanks. If I can, Bruno, I want to just point out this is a, a wonderful takeaway from this webinar. Slum tourism and township tourism were kind of the dark example of, you know, poverty porn or how tourism can exploit, you know, these poverty and social difficulties lived in townships. And now, Alyssa, you're sharing with us that this program that you're now part of that is actively reaching out to communities and, and training them and uh, easing their path towards tourism micro-entrepreneurship. It was born from the company and partners observing those problems in townships in South Africa. So I think we can take this as just a major aha, you know, like there are difficulties, but if we all come together, industry, communities, and academics, we can turn those into good things. So back to you, Bruno. Sorry that I couldn't resist pointing that out. No problem. Um, well, let, let me just reiterate that we are welcoming uh, questions from the audience and uh, not sure if Tom has uh, a pressing question right now. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested, especially from a European point of view, in, in the thoughts of our panelists right across the board, because I think one of the um, almost inevitable trends that we've seen in, in Europe in the, in, in the last couple of years, and this has sort of brought, been brought together by, a, um, by planned legislation within the European community, is relates to regulation in the, um, in the gig economy, not specifically in the, in sort of the, the platforms in the accommodation sector, because I don't think they are as um, high profile in this respect, but particularly in relation to say employment rights and employment conditions where um, there, are, there, is, there, there are some black holes, if you like, particularly in say the, uh, the, the food delivery sector, the, 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 the transportation sectors. Um, and I wonder if you have, have any thoughts, I would, I would, I would um, intuitively expect from the other side of the Atlantic that there would be a more of a, a sense of, um, of hostility to regulation. And yet we, we already heard about the implications of, put it, of, if you like, 
um, formalizing some of the, um, the campsite, the camping provisions, with, with, um, having the potential to draw in local regulation. So just thoughts on regulation. Um, I mean, and I suppose both from Elisa, but also from the, 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 the micro entrepreneurs that we've got with us today. Sas, you, you mentioned a little bit that your business model, Harvest Host's business model, kind of wedges a nice line where you don't have, uh, hosts don't have to face a lot of additional regulation. And but do you mind uh, reiterating some of that? Yeah. So the one thing with, we do have questions come up about regulation because small townships and cities are looking and saying, well, you have an RV parked in your parking lot or at your farm, how, why can they spend the night? But for us, it's there, we're not handing over, our members aren't handing over money directly to pay to spend the night. They're handing over money to support the business. So we always just suggest that is how to overcome any regulation issues. Um, it's hard for us to be in every single township across the United States and Canada to be able to tell each host, you know, this is what you should do to be able to get through to that, but it's something we are facing more and more and hoping it doesn't, you know, draw back to the opportunity to become a host, but certain places like California has been a tough one for us, um, just more strict regulations on who can spend the night and the parking of overnight vehicles. So, but the way we really look at it is we're not handing over a payment to stay the night like you would at a hotel. So it's just any other patron that's coming in to support the business. I, I would like to add to that thought. Um, I'm in Haywood County in Western North Carolina in the United States. Um, I work with the uh, county um, health and human services a lot because um, I'm on their radar and I'm certainly happy to do it. It's easier to just obey the rules and have everybody on your team. And they're very supportive. Um, I was informed as we were getting started with the camping that if we were to branch into lodging, so that means we're providing a shelter um, probably a bed, that four or more of those accommodations, we would be subject to inspection for the lodging. Um, when we got into the glamping decks, which are up on our mountain with this 360 degree view, suddenly I was meeting with the fire marshal. So, um, you know, two or more campsites like that. Now I was looking at building, you know, putting hundreds of thousands of dollars into roads that a fire truck could use. So I work with them a lot. Um, if the accommodation is over a certain square footage, I believe it's 400 square feet, you have to have sprinklers. They're making it up as they go along. The good news is we are, they're very receptive in our community. I will say a near, nearby town, um, they are trying to deter the overcrowding of their campgrounds. So the regulations are working both ways, not... Not, they're not just trying to maybe um, corner us as the, as the little guy, but they're also trying to improve their own communities. So by embracing um, the, you know, the, the primitive camping and allowing that on private farms, they're taking the pressure off of the campgrounds. And that's what Harvest Host is doing, right? You can, you can just pull in and have a, like you said, not stop at a Walmart, not stop at a Cracker Barrel. So, um, you know, I, I think going forward, if the regulations are thoughtful, we always want them to be thoughtful, don't we? Um, that, that, you know, we just need to be sure that we're available to contribute our opinion. And a lot of um, small farms around my area, they don't want to get involved. Um, and I fear if you're not involved, then your voice won't be heard, so. It seems that uh, both the micro entrepreneurs and uh, destination managers like Jonathan and the platforms are all worried about ambiguity on regulation, not necessarily on the existence of good regulation. And so I think that's probably a good consensus from the nods that I see here. I myself am, uh, have a family farm in Portugal and we almost lost our farm because of the, in Europe, um, there was a commercial kitchen regulation that emerged really fast and the local municipality didn't understand it very well, but they had pressure to interpret it, it really quick. And so we had to invest on refurbishing that kitchen, but then the regulation was reinterpreted again and we had to do it once again. And that debt 
lingered with our business for a long, long time. And so that's kind of the difficulty. I've heard from destination managers that often they don't know they are, they are collecting occupancy tax, even though they, it's not clear if private home rentals are legal according to the local regulation. And so a lot of us, you know, all of, and uh, I think as Sash mentioned, it's import, impossible for a, a business that creates impact at scale like uh, VAWA, Harvest Hosts and Airbnb to know the regulations across the board. And I think Airbnb is actually, uh, we know that they you engage with local regulations, trying to get on top of things, understand, and maybe even influence a little bit to make tourism more democratic. I wonder in this uh, aspect, we've talked about farms and lodging, and uh, I think we don't have somebody in the transportation sector, Tom, related to worker rights. There's a lot of stuff on the media I read about. But how about in the arts, Katika? Do you have, do you bump into any kinds of issues at that regard, or is it more of an innocuous space that you haven't had to deal with regulation like that? Yeah, uh, we haven't. It's kind of a gray zone right now, so we haven't run into specific issues. Um, the one thing that has worked uh, for us so far is all the artists we work with are master artists, which means they have established studios. So they already have um, uh, insurance, for example, for their studio. Um, so um, currently we kind of tap into that a little bit and it's been good to understand um, the requirements of artists in different countries. Um, in certain countries, there are laws around apprentice, like who the apprentices need to get paid um, uh, if they're coming and learning from the artist. Um, in our case, the apprentices are paying for learning. Um, so, um, but again, you know, apprentice is a word that we use, but in reality, they are, you know, just travelers who are, who are going to learn. So, so yes, there are gray zones between who is an apprentice and who is a traveler versus, you know, and then uh, for studios, like a lot, a lot of the artists have um, a studio insurance, but if there are a lot of the artists in other countries where they don't have, then we are working on finding ways to support them uh, there. So yes, right now it's a, it's a very new space. So we haven't encountered um, uh, very serious regulations. So we're just trying to understand mm -hmm. it. Thank you. So I'll point out that this is also pushing, these ambiguities are also pushing these uh, charismatic local people deeper into kind of the informal sector and trying to stay out of trouble and stay invisible to some degree. And so that's characterizing, that's like specific of these problem. You know, if we can bring uh, all of these uh, micro entrepreneurs, guides, creatives, farmers into the front stage with dignity and with their chest out because they bring character to the destination, then we owe it to them to sort out these issues that make them a little reluctant to draw too much attention to themselves. Um, Bruno, we have time uh, for maybe another five or 10 minutes for questions and up to you how to best make Yeah, it. so I would like to comment uh, on that and uh, maybe it would be worthwhile to mention one study that we did a while back where, where we measured uh, micro-entrepreneurial self-efficacy and we measured well, self-efficacy would, would be the, the belief in your ability to succeed in, in, in a given ta task, right? So we, we measured different dimensions. And what we saw was that micro entrepreneurs were scoring very high in, in dimensions like uh, pursuing innovation or aligning their businesses according to their uh, self, to their idiosyncrasies. Um, in other dimensions, but the, the one dimension where they scored the, the, the lowest was exactly this adapting to externalities, meaning you know, navig how to navigate this changing legal landscape. Um, so that was an interesting fact, but then we also <laughs> measured um, 
uh, entrepreneurial intention, in this case, would be their intention to add value to their business. And that didn't seem to preclude them from, from um, adding value to the, to the business, but for example, by expanding the business or, or um, maybe expanding uh, another product line. So this means that, well, they, if they're going to do it, they're going to do it anyway, and then maybe they'll figure it, figure it out uh, on the way. And, and that reminds me of one micro entrepreneur that I, I met here in, in Haiku in, in China. He, he's he's um, in the glamping business, and he has a wonderful uh, camping ground. Uh, so I, I, just, I just did this experience last year last uh, week and uh, well, it's amazing but he's just trying to figure it out he's not not sure what he can do and what he cannot do well in China it's not as regulated as in other parts of the world like Europe or US so he, he didn't have a, a, a bathroom which would be maybe unthinkable in, in other in other places but yeah he's, he's trying to um, to take incremental steps and the bathroom is already under construction, but he, he didn't want to uh, wait until the, the bathroom was constructed to start receiving gas because like that he can make some money at, at the same time, uh, getting some freed back. Um, so it, it's really important. It also speaks to, to, to our, our scholarship. Um, so that was pretty much what I wanted to, to comment on that. And But I would la also like to give opportunity to uh, someone from the audience who was brave enough to uh, send me a question. So I'm really happy. Um, I, I suspect he's a student of mine. And this uh, question is for Alisa Ramirez. And um, to give you some background, uh, well, I think you know this much better than, than I do. So Airbnb is not, does not have a very strong presence here in China. So the question from, from um, this, uh, the, the student of mine is, I want to ask that, um, sorry, uh, how Airbnb manages and evaluates the information um, by users and make sure the safety, both for the hosts and the guests. So these are like the issue of, of, of safety and security here in China is, is a pressing one. So maybe you can uh, answer to this question. Thank you. I'm not sure I fully understand the question around, um, is it asking about kind of the information that is communicated between hosts and guests? Yeah, so I think that the question has two, two points. The first one, how do you uh, manage uh, the information, I, I think, how, how is that you vet the, um, the hosts? And the second part would be how you ensure the, the safety for both hosts and guests. Okay. Um, on the, the safety piece, when we, when we do encourage all of um, communication going through the Airbnb um, portal. So hosts and guests communicate with one another through the app. And in those cases, um, you know, we make sure our Airbnb teams, um, you know, they're, they um, are able to basically troubleshoot if there are issues that come up. Um, I'm not as familiar. It's not really my area of expertise when it comes to kind of the data and privacy side, especially as it relates to China. I know there's a lot of complexities and intricacies in the ways that uh, we do have a full team working on Airbnb in China, and they are definitely the experts when it comes to that. Um, I would just say that we we do look at these areas very proactively and um, are you know fully resourced within the company to look at issues such as uh, privacy, safety, and security. But unfortunately, I don't have the expertise necessarily to speak on it. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Tom? Yeah. Um, yes, I'm, I'm particularly interested in um, in, 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 in the concept that Harvest Host were, were um, presented to us. And at the moment, the, the reach seems to be manageable. How do you scale up a, um, a business like that? How do you uh, 
uh, and and still retain, if you like, the intimacy that you clearly have with your um, with your hosts. And uh, if you like, how do you manage the, retain the human side of um, of uh, within your business model? Yeah, so we have two uh, pillars. We have our host success team. And we have our member success team. So we have two separate kind of channels who are managing our members versus our hosts. So there's always going to be a person on the other end that's there 24 seven for either the member or the host. So we are scaling at an, un, an outrageous pace right now. It is a little hard to know what the future holds for us um, versus the last two years because we've scaled so quickly, but just being able to have that team in place so you know that you have the support on the back end and if you're a host, you know, you're connecting with somebody who's very familiar with the host platform and how to do the back end of hosting. If you're a member, you're reaching out to someone who's familiar with membership and how to use the membership. So we, we try to streamline it in those two ways. So you're getting in touch with someone who's an expert in what you're reaching out about. Um, but as we continue to grow and have more hosts, that means we just have to ramp up our team and have more teams. So each person can, you know, receive an answer quickly and know that there, there's someone there in their corner. Uh, could I turn this question to Gitika as well? Because it's interesting to have two medium-sized platforms that have kind of taken a, a very different approach to growth. Gitika, you have a global reach, but you have master providers that you almost seem to know by name. Yeah, that's right. Um, so again, I think over, over time, what we've done is kind of operationalize a lot of the processes so that um, as we're scaling artists, we are able to maintain that same level of intimacy and interaction uh, with each of these artists. Um, um, you know, of course, it's taken us a while to get there, but I think now we're in a good place where uh, we know exactly what are the things we're asking them for, uh, what are the things they need from us. Um, and so the more uh, we can fine tune our processes, the better we can train our team members and then they can take this on. So, um, but of course we, we are also um, developing our own technology. I mean, um, there's, it's, it's great what is possible with technology where you can really use some of the newer technologies to personalize things um, uh, and, and really customize it. So it's a combination of using humans uh, for what they're best at and using technology for what it's best at um, uh, while maintaining a really human experience. Great, thank you so much. Bruno, is it okay if we wrap it up? Absolutely, do you wanna do the honors? <laughs> Actually, I would uh, just pass it over to Kazem uh, for a second. I'll share the screen again because we have um, uh, if you, Kazem, could just um, thank the participants and then um, I'll introduce the last uh, the, the upcoming webinars. Thank you very much. It was uh, very informative. Um, discussion, I learned a lot, <clears throat> particularly from the practical examples that I saw from a micro entrepreneurship. Um, I could see that um, different parts of a destination are important to make this happen. If we have um, a good food on the table, we have to bring people around the table too. If we have um, a good destination and attractive uh, activities. We have to uh, enable the marketing system and uh, reaching the, um, the target uh, for each. So um, I, I have seen the artists who travel uh, across borders and they attract people because art has, as, um, as it is obvious, it has, uh, uh, its own international language. It's a mean of uh, communication. It brings people together as tourism does. Um, so um, it's all, um, I think all the speakers, they, they talk uh, in the same language. And um, even if they are doing uh, accommodation or they are doing uh, 
tourism activities in a small scale. Uh, so it is all about how to keep um, people satisfied in a destination and how to manage all this together. Thank you very much. It was really uh, uh, a pleasure uh, for me to uh, see the examples of uh, what uh, you guys, especially in P1T are doing, and it is, it is great. I've been involved in uh, similar activities in Japan and in Asia and mainly, and um, I hope in another occasion we can share the examples of uh, East Asians or, or Japanese examples of my micro entrepreneurship in the world. Um, as Duarte mentioned, we have a series of these webinars, uh, and I would like to invite uh, you uh, to organize another beautiful webinar like today uh, with this call. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kazem. So yes, next webinar from this series is on global, you know, acting local and thinking globally, which is kind of uh, present on what we're doing today. And uh, the next one that I have the pleasure to host is in February, and it's about artificial intelligence at the service of making destinations more equitable and sustainable. So I hope that um, these interest you. And I thank all the panelists and I thank all the participants. And as we mentioned, this will be up on the web very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank so, you much, so much for organizing this. Take care. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Take care, folks. Yes. We'll follow up. <laughs>